Michio, and tonight we're going to read a story by Hans Christian Andersen. here. 
all the same to me. It is indeed a most marvelous romance, and here we are in it. We creep and crawl about, but always stay where we are, while all the while the globe keeps turning around, but never splashing its ocean spray over us. The crust on which we move remains solid, so that we never fall through, and so it is a story of millions of years with steady progress. Many thanks for your book on pebbles. Those old fellows could tell us so much if only they could talk. Isn't it funny to be a nobody once in a while like me, and then remember that we all, whether we have the best shoe blacking or not, are just like tiny ants on the anthill of the world, even though some of us ants have stars and decorations, honors and offices, and it makes you feel so ridiculously young compared with the millions of years of these venerable stones. I read your book on New Year's Eve and became so lost in it that I entirely forgot my usual New Year's Eve entertainment watching the wild hunt to a mug, but you don't know what that is. The witch's flight to the Bloxburg on Midsummer's Eve, of course, is well known, but we also have a wild mob in this land and in our time which speeds to a mugger on New Year's Eve. All the bad poets, poetesses, newspaper hack writers, musicians, and artistic lions who are not worth anything else ride through the air to the Amager on New Year's Eve. They sit astride their pencils or quill pens, for steel pens are too stiff for writing. I watch them every New Year's Eve. I could name most of them, but it isn't worthwhile. They don't imagine that anybody knows of their trip through the air on the quill pens. There's a sort of a niece of mine who is a fisherwoman and writes scandal and slander for three respectable papers. She says she has been out there as an invited guest and they carried her, for since she cannot herself use a pen, she couldn't write on one. She has described the whole affair. Half of what she told me is probably a lie, but the other half is enough. When she was well underway, they all broke into song. Each of the guests had written his own song, and each sang his own composition, because, of course, he thought it was the best. They were all very much alike, and all sung to the same melody. Then, in little groups, up marched those who occupy themselves only as chatterboxes. They were now singing bells that sang alternately. Then came small drummers, who drummed in family groups. Those who write anonymously were introduced to those, let me say here, whose grease is used for shoe polishing. There was the executioner and his helper, and the helper was the worst, for otherwise no one would have paid any attention to him. There was the street sweeper with his cart, who turns over his dustbin and calls it good, very good, remarkably good. During all this merriment, such as it was, there would shoot forth from holes, scattered about now a gaunt stalk, now a leafless tree, a huge flower, or a large mushroom. And finally, a roof that bore upon itself everything this honorable assembly has given to the world during the preceding year. Bright sparks could be seen glittering among them. There were borrowed thoughts they had used, which now cut themselves loose and flew up like fireworks. A game called The Stick Burns was played, and the younger poets played Heart Burns. The jesters told their jokes, and the jokes rang out like empty pots. thrown against doors. My niece said it was the most amusing she 
watching them break loose up in the north, drift along on icebergs ages before the building of Noah's Ark, sink to the bottom of the sea, then mount again on a reef, and at last peer up through the water and say, this shall be a seal. I saw them become the homes of many different birds whose species we don't know, and the homes of savage chieftains we don't know either until the axe hewed out in runic letters. The names of a few that could thus take a place in our histories, I had gone beyond all lapse of time and had become a non-entity. Then three or four beautiful shooting stars fell. They shone brightly, and started my thoughts off in an entirely different direction. Does anybody know what a shooting star really is? The learned do not know, but I have my own idea about them, and this is it. How often is it that not a single word of thanks or blessing is given for a generous action or beautiful work that rejoices all who witness it? Yes, often that gratitude is voiceless, but still it doesn't fall wasted to the ground. I can fancy it is caught up by the sunshine. Eventually the sunbeams carry it away and shower it over the head of the benefactor. Sometimes the thanks of a whole nation are thus too. They may come late, but at last they do come like a bouquet when a shooting star falls over the grave of some hero or statesman. Thus, it's a great thrill to me when I see a shooting star especially on New Year's Eve, and try to guess for whom the bouquet of gratitude can be meant. A short time ago, a radiant shooting star fell in the southwest. Now for whom could that have been attended? I am sure it fell right over the bank by the Flensburg Fjord, where the white crossed flag of Denmark floats over the graves of Schleppergrill, Lesor, and their comrades. Another one fell in the heart of Zealand, fell upon Sora. I'm sure that was a bouquet for a Holbrook's grave, a thanksgiving from the multitude who during years past have laughed over his delightful place. It is a great thought, a happy thought, sir to know that a shooting star like that will fall upon our own graves. Well, none will ever fall on mine. No sunbeam will bring me things, for I haven't done anything to be thanked for. I don't even merit polish for my boots, said all. My lot in life has been only to get degrees. The second On another New Year's Day, I went to the tower, and this time all talked about the skull. Toasts that had been drunk with the change of the old year to the new. Then he gave his story of the glasses, and there was sense in what he said. On New Year's Eve, when the clock strikes twelve, people rise from the table with freshly filled glasses and drink a toast to the new year. So people begin the new year with a glass in their hands, and that's fine for people who like to drink. Others start the year by going to bed, and that's first rate for lazy bones. But then sleep is sure to play a leading part in the coming year, and so is the glass. Do you know what lives in the glasses? He asked. Why? Health, happiness, and joy live there. Misfortune and bitter misery dwell there. When I count up the glasses, I can tell the gradations of the different people. You see, the first glass is the glass of health. In it grows the health herb. Stick that into your beam, and by the end of the year you may sit in the arbor of health. Now take the second glass. Ah, yes, out of it there flies a little bird, singing 
with such innocent happiness that men listen to it, and perhaps sing with it, life is beautiful. We will not hang our heads, but cheer and courage forth. From the third class, a tiny winged imp darts out. You can't call him a little angel, for he has the blood and soul of a goblin. All for jest and mischief. He lurks behind our ear and whispers some queer trollery. He creeps into our heart and warms it until one becomes frolicsome, becomes the great wit in a party of wits. In the fourth class there is neither herb nor bird nor fairy. That class is the boundary line of sense beyond which you should never, never pass. Do you take the fifth class? Then will you weep over yourself or laugh with a fierce shout? For out of this class will spring riotous prince carnival, flippant and wild as an elf. He will overcome you until you forget your dignity, if you ever had any, and forget things you ought not to forget. All is dance and song and revelry. The masks carry you away with them, and the daughters of evil in silk and flowers come with flowing hair and alluring charms. Tear yourself loose if you can. And the sixth of the class, yes, in that sits Satan himself. A little, well-dressed, charming man who never contradicts you, tells you that you are always right. He comes with a lantern to guide you home. What sort of home and what sorts of spirits live there? There's an old legend about a saint who was ordered to, to choose one of the seven deadly sins and chose what he thought was the least drunkenness. But in it he committed all the other six. Man and the devil mixed with blood. That is the sixth class. And all the evil seeds within us thrive on it, and each of them sprouts with a force, like the grain of mustard in the Bible, and grows into a mighty tree, spreading out over the whole world. Most have nothing before them, but to be put into the smelting oven and be cast into a new mold. This is the story of the glasses, said Paul, the tower keeper, and it can be told both with shoe polish and grease, I give it to you with both. That was my second visit to all. If you want to hear more, we will have to pay him another visit. I hope you enjoyed the story, friends. Sweet dreams.